Hello, hello, hola, que andas, lo baja, amigos. My heaping dose of gratitude today goes to True Miller and her amazing assistant, Adriana, for uh, helping me line up the uh, th- this interview and a few others when I was down staying there a couple weeks ago. Um, when True staff calls, people listen, and it really helped to get to the people that I wanted to talk to uh, quickly. So thank you. Thank you, Adriana, and thank you, True, for making your staff and your home available to me. Uh, Okay, I've got a few more thanks to get to today. Lots of tacos are flying out of here. We've got the Nora 1000 in just about a month, and um, some folks have dropped some tacos in the tank, and I want to say thanks. So Andrew in Tempe, thanks, amigo. Doug in San Diego, um, so good to see you and have a chat in person. Thanks for the support. I appreciate it. Mark in L.A., gracias, amigo. And, yeah, I agree. More Pete Springer conversations. That guy's the best. Michael in Moraga, thank you. Kyle in Santa Barbara. Amy in North Carolina, you dropped an entire taco truck of tacos in the tank. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, support, Amy. Thank you. Um, Todd in Indiana, man, you not only are you dropping tacos in the tank, you're coming with me on the slow Baja Safari. This is going to be a major league adventure, amigo, and I'm glad that you're coming with me. Uh, Andrew in Laguna Beach, thank you. Yannick in Germany, thank you. Jamie, I appreciate it. Steve in Clovis, yes, sir, thank you for your support. Tim in DTLA, you're supporting the show. You're bringing two cars in the slow Baja Safari class. How much more? can you do? Um, Andrea, I want to say thanks to you. And I also want to acknowledge that you're uh, about to take your first Baja trip, which I think is so cool. And that your dad was, uh, your dad Irv was in the uh, first Mexican 1000, the Nora Mexican 1000 way back in 1967. So thank you for dropping some tacos in the tank, uh, this entire party platter, and I truly appreciate it. All right, on to the show today, folks. We have a beautiful um, person, a beautiful human being, Natalia Badan. She has been called the matriarch of the valley. She's been called the moral compass of the valley. She is a fierce fighter um, to curtail de- development in the valle. And she is just, a, a, you'll hear it in her voice. She's a beautiful, serious, thoughtful woman. I'm very glad that she made some time to talk to Slow Baja. Um, she spent her entire life as a steward of this uh, property that her f- mother and father built. Her father was of Swiss uh, descent and her mother was from France. And um, they got themselves to Mexico and uh, built in a stunning, exquisite, small um, winery, organic farm beautiful place in harmony with uh, the land. Um, they, they have about four acres of wine, and um, you can visit El Magor by appointment, and the, uh, the details will be in the show notes, but um, I think you can hear it. I'm smitten. <laughs> just, just sitting there in her presence was a beautiful uh, experience for me. So I hope you enjoy the, the show. Um, I'll be back with something fun next week. And without further ado, Natalia Badan of El Magor. Hey, this is Michael Emery. Thanks for tuning into the Slow Baja. This podcast is powered by Tequila Fortaleza, handmade in small batches, and hands down, my favorite tequila. Hey, I want to tell you about your new must-have accessory for your next Baja trip. Benchmark Maps has released a beautiful, beautiful Baja California Road and Recreation Atlas. It's a 72-page large format book of detailed maps and recreation guides that makes the perfect planning tool for exploring Baja. Pick yours up at benchmarkmaps.com. Well, hello. Hello, Michael. <laughs> Natalia Badan, El Magor. I am so delighted to be here. Thank you for making some time for Slow Baja. Oh, thank you for thank you. So, how do I begin? 
You're the grand dame of the valley. You you grew up on this property, yeah? Yes. Uh, I arrived when I was six months old. From Switzerland? A baby. Was it from Switzerland originally? No, I was born in Mexico City. Okay, but tell me about your, your parents. They did come from France and Switzerland? Yes, okay. my parents came from my father from Switzerland, my mother from France, although they were already Mexicans when I was born. Okay. Uh, which at, at that time it wasn't so easy. I wonder how they did it. But uh, they came in the f- in fifty because of the wars. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to go through another war, and uh, and they wanted Latin America, so they went through Guatemala, through Cuba. And through Mexico City, which at that moment was a paradise, I think. It was a small city. They used to have dinner with Siqueiros, uh, with the intellectuals of Mexico. And they had a great time. Uh, How did we end here? is probably what you would ask. Eventually. Yes. But uh, we have plenty of time. Well, my father was a great romantic and a great idealistic man. And uh, he was older than my mother and much older than me. He was 52 when I was born. And he had some friends that told told him about the Valley of Guadalupe. And they invited him to come to plant an olive grove. And my father had traveled a lot and he had lived in many countries and in particular, many of the Mediterranean countries. So when he arrived here, he just fell in love with like the Mediterranean light sky climate. And he decided, which was kind of foolish (laughs) to think about it, to come and stay here. And my mother, who was a Parisian, uh, was quite shocked, I believe. But anyway, we ended here in a valley where there was no road, almost no electricity. There There was almost nothing. There were vineyards, though, but not in this side. Well... That's their story. My story begins there. So this is my land. This is my latest souvenirs are from here. My first souvenirs, excuse me. And I'm very fond of this place. It's a beautiful place. It is. (laughs) So I I don't know where the flattery should begin. I spoke with Letta yesterday at Adobe Food Truck, and she said you are her pillar. You're her pillar of wisdom. You're her pillar of integrity. You're her pillar of morality. Uh, You're the center of the the Valle. You're blushing, but tell me. (laughs) That is high praise from a beautiful, beautiful person who does amazing work. Well, I think Letta is very, very kind. Um, I don't know what to answer. Uh, as I'm, I'm very fond of this place, I and of the vocation we've given to this place, because altogether 
we have given the vocation of a wine country and we did it all together working very hard uh, looking towards the future promoting the culture of wine as we thought of it in a very I think elegant way as a um, civilizatory uh, thing um, or um, concept so I think Leda has seen me fighting yes you know? yes for keeping I, I have fight a lot and I still do uh, because I I fight for the environment for uh, agri ecology ecological agriculture the soil the good wines the vocation of agriculture of the valley um, and well this has happened lately I think it has happened about from 10 years to now so I think Leda sees me like that <laughs> well y as I understand it you've been making wine here since what 1980 is that yes 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 or making we and selling I should say you've probably been making wine here a long time before that no we used to grow the grape the grow the vines uh, harvest the grape and sell them to the big wineries who didn't make so much wine at that time they used to make brandy but we all did that uh, cultivate the vines keep uh, keep uh, pick the grapes and sell them to them and was that to Santo Tomas primarily was it there I don't remember a lot in the early 80s that of wineries here I don't I don't remember no much. no they, they would make brandy okay there were some Spaniards over there who made a little wine a very good little wine but it was mostly for them but all of the all of us and there were many 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 vineyards at that time there were more vineyards at that time than now can you believe it no I can't there's 300 something vineyards now seemingly yeah but I'm talking about the fields the really the, the grape the grape growing now we are about probably 300 winemakers. Yes, excuse me, yes, correct. But at that time we didn't talk a lot about wine. It was like growing grapes, trying to have the biggest harvest so it would wait more and it would pay us more. Uh, and I'm talking about Cheto and Domecq mainly, okay. who got together, I don't know exactly how, this is... Uh, part of their story of their history and uh, and suddenly we got tired we didn't like it anymore to do that so it was my brother who said in the 80s let's do the wine ourselves and let's do great wines you know he was all he was a badon so he was also idealistic and and romantic you know, always like thinking of great things to do. And he did. So he went to Bordeaux and he went to the nicest wineries over there. All the chateaus and he came very enthusiastically say, we are going to do a great wine for Mexico. And I think it was a, a very nice declaration. No? So he began and he grafted my parents' vineyard with Bordeaux varieties and he made his first wine in 87. Uh, and it was a very good wine. <laughs> so after that came, next year came Monte Chanique 
with exactly the same declaration. We're going to make very good wines for Mexico. Of course, they were very big and they were very rich. And they were very beautiful people, <gasps> but they did also. And that is how it all began. Because Santo Tomas, which is older, uh, was more in the south, in the Santo Tomas Valley, and in Ensenada. It wa they weren't so much here. So that, ha that is how it all began. And then came Hugo da Costa, who, who's a very important person. Um, he came to work to San in Santo Tomas, and he had also this vision of this has to be a wine valley. This has to be the main wine valley of Mexico. And he's an enologist, a professional enologist, so we all learned a lot with him. He is a very generous person in the way that he taught anyone who would approach to ask for um, counseling or he would just he even did a little school for many years we called it la escuelita where he taught how to make wine so many of the wineries now um, are issued from the the escuelita which is really nice mm -hmm. Their origin, they were born there. Yes, they were born there. Yeah, you know, you make your first barrel and you get caught. <laughs> 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 and uh, then you say, well, it was very good. Let's make a second one. And there you are, like, involved in this uh, very nice world that is winemaking and grape growing. Yes. And you've taken that a little bit past that organic farm we were all always organic F since my father's time they call it at that time biological biological agriculture and everybody thought we were completely crazy but my father was uh, he studied a lot so he he had all the I remember having all the books issued from the University of California, Davis. You know, it's from my childhood rem remembering, no? Him studying and marking all the books. So we were, we were biological. Now it's common, it's in fashion. We talk more about it. I think it is very important to talk about it because we had the climate change and it has to do with that, you know, it's an enormous challenge that we have. But at that, w at that time it seemed a little eccentric because we were very near the Green Revolution and the Green Revolution, which is a term that I also heard as a child, was using chemicals to produce a lot and to uh, e eradicate hunger in the world and we were very near so being biological at that time was like yeah, eccentric you were you eccentric. were out doing your own thing yes but you so were, we've but you were doing the right thing i'm absolutely sure we're doing the yeah, right thing absolutely. in that sense in yes that sense. so when i said you have a an organic farm but you're you're providing the 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 food for this Valley as well with f these restaurants. You're selling the the lettuces and you're selling the the produce yes. here. You're yes, it's a, it's a, a. You're just not feeding yourself, is what I can get. Uh, no, to. no, 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 no. You have a farmers market here. Yeah, here. well, so tell I me don't have uh, it anymore, unfortunately, because I don't have enough water. But I have a garden. Uh, because of course I couldn't live without a garden, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I share it with Deckmans and some very close friends, but I had a, a farmer's market for 24 years. And it was an, a very beautiful experience, you know, like making the soil produce very good food and sharing it with people it was very, very, very satisfying. And I regret not doing it anymore. But water has become very scarce. 
so I have to adjust my project to the water I have to be coherent with my with what I say. And your water comes from the mountain behind us. Yes. So mm, tell me about it. Tell me well, about how your water is different or better. Well, I'm simply very lucky because water in the river of Guadalupe, in the bottom of Guadalupe, has become salty because of overexploitation. And I have this beautiful water that comes from the mountain that is extremely good extremely good it's it's not very much I would need much more but it has a, you know, a very good quality so we try to use it as wisely as possible and really to make water management something very important water management and you know key lines and harvesting rainwater and all these hippie things mm -hmm. that are very important. Well, we had quite a bit of rain here recently. Well, we had one inch. Yes, but we've been through a very severe drought for two years now. Now it's nice and green, but well, hopefully we'll have a little more rain this weekend. But yes, it has become scarce. So we really have to work on another model of agriculture. And I think it is extremely fascinating. I am fascinated with it, you know, creating soil, not tilling anymore, being, of course, strictly organic. I wouldn't be able to be another thing because I don't know. I mean, it's like natural and normal for me. You know, sometimes they ask me, why don't you put in your labels? And I say, because it is not a commercial concept. It is because I believe in it, so I won't put it. It's and probably foolish, but... But it's honest and from the heart. Yes. <laughs> With a large smile. I wish you were here, folks, to see this. <laughs> Just a beautiful, beautiful, honest uh, smile. Well, tell me more about the property. How many... How uh, Can you talk about what's oh. here and what where we're at your home? Is this... Are we sitting on the yes, veranda of yes, your home? This is my home, yes. So you have your home here. Yes. There's a famous chef who seems to do wonderful things under a tree on s yes, somewhere over there. Yes, yes. Let, let me tell you, this is an enormous property that I inherited. It's about 1,000 hectares, which when I inherited, I thought it was completely crazy. You know, I, re I remember walking in the mountain. Of course, there's a lot of mountain. And, you know, I, th I would think... Why do I have so much and what am I going to do with it? I am so grateful now because I feel it protects me against, well, many aggressive things that are happening in the valley that shouldn't be happening, I think. And uh, I'm working this year on making it a, a protected area. Uh, like a certified protected area. So now I'm grateful it is big and it has mountains and a lot of chaparral. What do we do? Well, we do what we call diversified uh, activities. So we have several little projects that um, interact one with the other. So, of course, I would say that we have the project of the vineyard. We have the project with the winery that goes together. We have the organic garden that went for 24 years with the market. But, n well, now it goes like more like to the restaurant. We have sheep. And we have some cows because we believe we, n we need it for um, improving the land. So we make this technique uh, of moving the animals from one place to another so they don't overgraze. And 
where they go through the soil becomes better with the time. This is a, a very long-term project. And I was interested when they told me slow Baja, and I <laughs> said, well, okay, yes, it, has, it does make sense for me. Because improving soil and making a ranch like this more fer fer fertile? Yes, fertile. fertile. Uh, takes uh, many, 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 many years, much, many more than what I will leave. But I think it is worth. So, so we have the sheep, and we have the cow, and we have the garden, and we have the carob grove, which dates from my father because my father planted carob trees because some person at the University of California told him that it was a good um, tree for this region. So I'm trying to make them flourish again. And well, o all this melts one with the other, helps one with the other. And this way, we don't put all the eggs in the same basket. Do you have that expression? Yes, in we English? do. Well. Yes. And finally, we have Mr. Deckmans, who arrived 10 years ago and who asked me to put a restaurant. And I told him, well, there's no place to put a restaurant here. I, and he said, yes, 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 uh, under a tree. And, uh, well, it what he told me seemed interesting. So he began under a tree, and it was very charming. It was very charming, and he's a very good chef. It has grown now. I kind of regret it. <laughs> because it was more bucolic, you know, it was really... But well, the valley has changed also, and for people like me, it's like sometimes it's hard to understand or accept changes that are so um, uh, strong, no? Aggre aggressive, maybe. Yes, but uh, Drew Deckman is there, and uh, we think he makes loc uh, f food with local produce, which is great. He defends the ocean as a warrior, which is great. Um, he's good with his people, which is great. So we get along well. We get along well. And of course, he, I sell him my wines and my lambs and my veggies. So it's part of the whole thing. That is, yeah, that is El Mogor now. Hey, do you wish you had joined us on the Nora 500? Well, here's your chance. It's double the mileage, double the fun, double the parties, double the dirt. It is the Nora Mexican 1000. We're gonna drive by day, we're gonna party by night. I'm pouring four delays of tequila. April 30th through May 6th, 2022, we're driving the entire peninsula. You don't want to miss out on this one. Again, if I can do it in my 1971 Toyota Land Cruiser, totally stock, you can do it in any modern 4x4. The Nora Mexican 1000 is the happiest race on earth. Check it out at Nora.com, N-O-R-R-A.com, or on Slow Baja. Here at Slow Baja, we can't wait to drive our old Land Cruiser south of the border. When we go, we'll be going with Baja Bound Insurance. Their website's fast and easy to use. Check them out at BajaBound.com. That's BajaBound.com, serving Mexico travelers since 1994. Let's talk about your fight. You're fighting to keep this, this valley from becoming Wine Disneyland. Yes. Well, I think it was Wine Disneyland, and now I think it's even worse because some opportunistic entrepreneurs, and I'm not afraid of calling them like that, um, 
just saw our work that took generations and began like to attract tourism but not exactly the tourism we want for the activities we want so now they're installing a lot of um, I don't know how you say anthros in English like bars and places to have a lot of fun which is fine don't think I'm you don't look like you're against fun no of course not yeah. but I think what they're doing is very urban and it should be in the city which is not very far from here no you can have both oh of course both things of course but so don't ruin this thing well it's very aggressive with what we do y we would like to keep ru rurality because I think there are m a lot of people living in very big cities and they appreciate rurality. You know, we have a very simple place where we see people. It's under a tree. And always the visitors say, oh, you know, it reminds me my grandmother's house or... It has always something, you know, it, it, it has a repercussion on people. And it's simply a tree and some chairs. So I think we would, should go in that way. And that goes very well along with keeping a vineyard, making wine. But when you begin with very heavy music all night long, lights everywhere and it simply doesn't go that long it's not that I'm against it no it's not for here it though. simply it is not for here and it's very menacing because it's a very good business by the way very good business so there are more and more and more and I think it is a great I think it can destroy the, the valley if you see it in I don't know 10 years very soon so there we have to be you know like trying to to fight yes to fight frontly but also like to create a certain sensibility of what we have and we could lose forever so we need nature we need valleys we need agriculture place we need calm we need silence we need listening to the birds beautiful and at night we we need watching the stars and hearing and listening to the coyotes so this type of development that they're thinking about in like okay it is a lot of money but we're going to pay it very 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 heavily because it's one place and another and another and another and what what are we living for for next generations so yes i i do fight sometimes i'm tired because i've been fighting for 30 years and fortunately there are younger people now that are that are doing it but well I'm still there. <laughs> well, let's still let's there. change the channel a little bit and tell me a little bit about your friends here in the Valle and the places that you love and the things that are doing it. A pla people that that if oh, you're many. if you're leaving your ranch here. There are many. Where do there you want many, to go? There w I have a lot of friends um of the the winery the wine people, most of them are very um, solidary. We help each other. We laugh together. 
we work a lot together, we exchange, we're very happy when somebody makes a great wine. And this is very important. It gives us a great quality of, of life. Um, At your heart, you're all farmers. Yes. This is an agricultural business. It's, yes, it's not, it is. It's, 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 it's an elegant product sometimes. Yes. But it's not a sophisticated process. No, 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 no. We have it's, to be very close dirty to hands. the. Dirty we hands. have to be very close to nature. Very close, and we're sensitive to it. So we're very happy when it rains, even if it's muddy. We're happy when it is cold because we always think about our little plants that need the cold. There was frost on the ground today as I was walking through the vineyards at Adobe Guadalupe. You know, you could see the sparkle of the frost. Yes, yes, which is nice now. Uh, the, we need it. Grapes like cold. And when we have these warm winters, we worry. So we're very, very, very close to, to nature. And I think that gives us a, an enormous strength. And we are, we are a very nice and solidary group which is extraordinary. And, well, that is very par a particular pleasure. More and more people are going organic and interested in like alternative ways of doing it. And, well, that gives me a lot of satisfaction because I think we were the only ones for many, many years. Do you still have your father's books from UC Davis? Of course. <laughs> it's not so Treasures. far from where I live, you know, just an hour and a half. It, of course I have them. They're treasures. Yeah, and they're all marked, you know, underlined. So, yeah, those are the family treasures, you know, that give us your guiding the way light. where to go. Your guiding light. So let's go back to your father's arrival here. As I was walking over to your veranda, we passed a large rock in your, in your yard. And there's the, the worn places there that the ancient people ground their, their grains there. Yes. Yes. Baja California has have had human inhabitants for thousands of years. They, were, they would go from the mountain to the sea, back and forth within the seasons, and uh, they were hunters and fishermen, and but they were nom nomads. And this house where we are is where I came with my four children when my mother got old, and she was tired of hearing such a. <laughs> noisy family, but I used to live over there near where Deckman is. That is my infancy home. And this little house, w this house was a little adobe house that my father built like for the man in charge. So I told my husband, let's re rearrange it and make it a little bigger for our family. So that's what I, we did. But suddenly I realized that, I don't know how many years ago, probably thousands or hundreds of years, there was just here families that were living. Yes. And it is probably, you know, I've always felt in El Mogor like a very nice atmosphere. I know it sounds a little heapy, but like good vibrations, you know, it's, it's a nice place. So probably the fact that they were living here has left that. So I just treasure my molcajetes in the, yeah, in the granite And you have rocks. three quite clear oh, molcajetes, absolutely. three. I wonder how yeah. many else are around. Oh, there are in the ranch, there are more. Amazing. So they used to grind the the um, fruits of the oak, which I don't yes, the acorns. acorns, acorns, yes, yeah, and make an atole with them. 
And your father, did he build most of this with his hands or oversee it? Is it is it all of his vision? Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. As you I'm said, just an idealist. Continuing. Yeah. I'm just continuing. Yes. And is there somebody to come after you? I have four children, so mm -hmm. hopefully, yes. I won't force anything, but three of them are here now. Your eyes are twinkling. <laughs> well. It's a lot of work, though. It is a lot of work. It is. All the oh, time. Yes. And it's like almost every day and almost all the year. There is a little place in November where you can go. You know, once you finish the wine, you finish the harvest, the grapes are just like beginning to rest, and you go elsewhere to see the world and to take a rest. But it's the only part of the year where you can do that. All the rest, you just grab by nature and you have to follow it because you, you, timing is very important in agriculture. Well, you just took a look at your rosemary, which is blooming and yes. swarming with bees. Yes. And you said aloud, I have to plant more rosemary. Yes. <laughs> Immediately, like, yes. <laughs> yes, we have to plant rosemary. Plant more rosemary, keep more bees. Feed more bees. Yes. They're having a tough time. Yes. Um, the products that are here that go to Deckman's, fruits, vegetables, your trees are laden with citrus right now. Just yes. stunning, beautiful um, lemons. You've put two stunning oranges on the table, <laughs> but it looks like you have grapefruit and other things as well. Oh, yes. I have apricots. I have, uh, well, yeah, kumquats. I have persimmons. I have apples. And I do, uh, I preserve all that. Yeah, I do jams. And baking as well? Not so much because I have a bad oven and I haven't changed it. <laughs> How many things I can do, you do? But, but I, uh, yeah, but I have in the garden, you know, in summer I just make ratatouille and keep it and tomatoes. Yes, yes, yes. I learned that from my mother. Um, she was extremely good doing and I, and I just saw her all my childhood, so I just make the same. Uh, having good food is very important. And when you grow your own things, you're it's so satisfying. <laughs> so we, yes, we do have honey also. Um, and the vegetable, just the season ones. So when it's summer, it's tomatoes and eggplants and chiles and and in winter it's cauliflower and cabbage and lettuce. Root so vegetables. And root vegetables, exactly. So I just go with nature. I don't force anything. Just but there's a big greenhouse here, so it's there uh, is a big green. Yeah, it's just to elongate a little bit yes. or shorten. But I don't. I don't heat it, or I don't. I don't do artificial things. No. I wouldn't think so. So tell me about your sheep. How come? Oh, that's a very nice story. Oh, that's yes, it is a very nice story. Let me tell you about. There is a ranch up there, and there used to be a ranchero with his wife, and they had a baby. And that baby grew up, and he needed to go to school, but it was very hard for them to uh, drive to Encina with the little boy and then coming back. And at that, at that time, my children were going every day to Encina to school. So he came here and he said, could you take him? And I said, well, of course I can take him. So we would go with the little child and leave him at his school and then my kids would go to another school and bring him back. And one day, after a few months, he came with the sheep and he said well i want to thank you so i brought your sheep and i said what <laughs> and he was very funny so he told me yes now it's one but then you'll have many and you can make a birria place 
near the road and you will become very rich with and I really didn't know what to do with the sheep. <laughs> Quite a gift. Quite so, a responsibility. So I I made a little um I know Clo, how do you say? To keep him inside. A little corral. A little corral near the house. Of course my kids were very happy with it. And suddenly there was a little baby, a little lamb. Well, that's the beginning. And I'm talking about more than 20 years ago. So then, and that's another very nice story, my kids went all away. When they were 18, they didn't want to know anything about the ranch, anything about my little things and my little town, and they wanted the big city. So I said, all right, and I sent them all to Mexico City. Right. So you want the big city? Go to the big city. So they went and they studied and they made their thing. And at the same time, one of my best friend, a uh, boy, was also in Mexico City at the university, but he really didn't like it at all. And his parents were desperate because they have, you know, PhDs, they are academics, etc. Pablo. And once he just told his parents, I don't want this anymore, I don't want to study, I hate school. And his, his father particularly was really, really very upset. So I told him, because he was one of my kids' friends, I told Pablo, why do you come to the ranch? Why don't you come to the ranch and uh, walk a uh, work a little bit here? And for him, he was a revel it was a revelation. He just loved it. And he said, this is what I want to be. So he became like a cowboy. And he loves animals. A so he took, care of the, he took the, the, the sheep in hands. He, he studied a lot uh, about how to graze them and how to feed them and everything. And that's how the, it grew. And, ha and that is how we began to sell the lambs to, to Drew Deckman. And then he went away because he got he 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 was in love with a Span Spaniard girl, and she took him to Spain. And there he is over there, raising horses or something like that. <laughs> but the uh, but uh, the lamb the sheep the herd you say a herd, the herd stayed, and it is here. And we take care of it. And is there cheese at all with the no. sheep? No, just solo, no, just the meat. No, no, that was, that was our po our project with Pablo, and I was very excited with it. But uh, that's really another complex uh, project, and no, we're not working on it. You're keeping it simple. Yes. Terrific. Yeah. Because it's quite complex as it is already. So if someone would say, okay, I'm going to make it, okay, fine, but not, not myself. Mm -hmm. That's a story. <laughs> it's a beautiful story. <laughs> and the cows? And the cows, those, are, those were my brothers. My brothers passed away in 2008, and I just kept them, and then I gave them to Pablo. Uh, and he took very good care of them and then he went away so there they are and now we're taking care of them and they're just they're mostly for working the ground much more than anything else S and they're so happy and they're so gentle you know if, uh, if they're on the road they won't move I have like to push them they're yes we learn to manage with non-stress, which is very nice. And very important. And very important. Yeah, so very unfortunately, sometimes we have to sacrifice some. It's very sad for me, but we have to um, shorten the, the herd. I cannot leave it grow. 
because when droughts come, it becomes hard. But they have a very, very good life. They do, and it looks like you have a very good life. Can people visit you here? Sure. They can try the wine? Oh, yes, Tell sure. me a little bit about that. Yes, well, yes, that's another nice story. When we began, my, my brother didn't want to receive, like, tourists. So he would receive people, but it was, like, his friends and so. He died, and uh, I decided to open the winery on weekends, Saturday and Sunday. So, to share with visitors, there weren't many at the time. And we would give the wine. It would be free. To taste. Yeah. And it was so nice, you know. They would just come and you would pour. Oh, it's nice. What do you think? And blah, blah, blah. And they would go. And then, well, people came more and more. So we did more. We began to make it pay. And and I was there myself for about three years. I was the only one pouring wine. And it was a very nice experience. A uh, strong experience because each visitor has a different personality. And you have like to... But it was very... I would give a lot of energy, but I would receive a lot also from people. But then I got a little tired of it and I said, well, so my kids began to do it. Uh, my daughter told me clearly, Mama, I'm not going to do it like you. And I said, well, that's fine. Everybody, each one has its own style. And then the pandemia made us close for several months. And then we reopened it. So now we received much less people because it was beginning to be like too much. So we didn't have like the attention we wanted, like more personal attention. So now we make it by appointment, very few people and we really work so they have a great time. They can stay as long as they want. And uh, we don't have like a, a speech. We go and see what their interests are or is. And we just talk with them as long as they want us to talk with them. And if they just want to stay there with a bottle. So it's nice. It's a very nice experience. And can you tell me a little bit about the wines that you make here? Yes, sure. Sure. So the first one was the the result from that that uh, trip to Bordeaux. So it's a Bordelais. It's Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. It's very nice. And uh, with the eyes twinkling, folks, <laughs> <laughs> and, and a smile nice straight from the heart. And it was born in in 87, so we've gone a long way with it. And it's our most famous wine, the most known. And then in in 2000, my brother Antoine went to Switzerland where my father was born, and there are uh, grapes there, white grapes. They make a wine that is called Fondant, and the Swiss love it and drink it all. You can almost you don't find it in stores because they just drink it. And he brought some l some little uh, sticks inside his uh, coat. A smuggler. Yeah. Yeah. He smuggled some plants and I th when he arrived I said you're completely crazy. Those, those grapes like cold. But they did beautiful. So that is our white wine. It's called Chasla del Mogor. And uh, uh, so after that, we stayed a long time with, the, with one white and one red. Of course, our project is very small. 
And then one summer I was under the pepper tree and it was so warm and I said, oh my goodness, how nice it would be to have a nice cold rosé. So I went to Hugo da Costa and I said, oh, I would like to make a rosé. Of course, he told me. With what grapes? And I said, well, I don't know. Well, try many and you'll tell me. <laughs> so we did our first rosé and it's called Arrebol. Arrebol, my daughter named it, and it's the colors of the clouds w at the sunset. It's very nice. It's a 100% Grenache. It's very nice. And then we made this uh, completely foolish adventure buying old vineyards in France that were being pulled out because nobody wanted them. And uh, uh, we, were t oh we got together 20, Hugo da Costa got us together and said, let's buy these vineyards because they're destroying them. And well, another story about romanticism. Uh, yes, let's save the vineyards in the long dock. So I bought a hectare of Syrah. We make the wine over there in a very little village, small, the smallest village you've ever seen. We bring it by boat, imagine. And then here we put it in barrels, we let it recuperate from the long trip and we blend it with grapes from here. So I make my French Mexican wine. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Which is very good. A little bit of work, though, to uh, save one hectare of... But enough people saved enough of it completely that it's... Completely foolish. Completely foolish. <laughs> well, it's good to be foolish. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, I appreciate you making some time for Slow Baja, and I'd like to stay and just keep talking to you about your, your beautiful world here. Um, I'll have your information for people to make an appointment, and I hope that the Slow Baja world will come in and enjoy this beautiful, beautiful uh, world you've created. Thank you. Thank you very much, for sure. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for sharing. coming, and thank you, to, thank you for being slow. <laughs> it's good <laughs> to be slow. <laughs> All right, thanks. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Antalya Badan. What a beautiful human being. El Magor is just an exquisite property. Strong, 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 slow Baja approved. Make the effort, make an appointment, get down there hang around for the afternoon and um, make sure you have a reservation to eat under the big tree with uh, Drew Deckman and get all those beautiful organic vegetables that are coming right from that farm and, and the little lambs too. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, on to nuts and bolts uh, for the first time in well over a year. Uh, the Modern Trucker is back in all styles, all flavors, green and white, gray and white, black and black. Dad hats are in. Uh, the old school trucker is also in. So if there is a hat that you've been coveting, they are back. If you need to replace your old grubby hat, get it now while they last. Don't know how much longer they're going to be in or how soon I'll be able to get them redone. But please, if you want one, slowbaja.com is your place to get them. Last item on the agenda, reviews, folks. We could use a few reviews. Haven't had a review this entire year. Am I whining? Man, it's April. Um, but it really does help. It helps people find the show. There's an algorithm out there that uh, when people are uh, leaving reviews, it seems like more people are listening. And, um, you know, I'd appreciate anything you can do on that front. Five star on iTunes or Spotify. Thank you very much. And as Steve McQueen once said, Baja's life, everything that comes before or after is just waiting. Have I told you about my friend, True Miller? You've probably heard the podcast, but let me tell you, her vineyard, Adobe Guadalupe Winery, is spectacular. From the breakfast at her communal table, bookended to an intimate dinner at night, their house-bred Azteca horses, Solomon the Horseman, will get you on a ride that'll just change your life. The food, the setting, the pool, it's all spectacular. AdobeGuadalupe.com. For appearing on Slow Baja today, our guests will receive the beautiful Benchmark Map 72-page Baja Road and Recreation Atlas. Do not 
go to Baja without this, folks. You never know when your GPS is going to crap out, and you're going to want a great map in your lap. Trust me.